Hello, my name is Andrea Carruthers and I am a PhD student in natural resources with an emphasis in agroforestry. And I will be talking about one of the projects I'm currently working on, uh, which is uh, exploring the social networks of American elderberry growers. My research takes a human dimensions approach that examines the adoption and maintenance of agroforestry practices. And for this project, more specifically, I'll be focusing on uh, the adoption of American elderberry. And the project presents an opportunity to use a social science approach to explore some of the more complex interactions behind farmers and landowners' decisions to adopt new practices for the purpose of identifying opportunities that could further encourage the adoption of agroforestry. So a little bit of background. I started collecting data from the River Hills Harvest Elderberry Conference and Workshop back in uh, June of 2022. I distributed a few short surveys to identify important information sources and resources that American elderberry growers use uh, to work towards their objectives and presented some of the results at the World Congress on Agroforestry um, in Quebec City in uh, July of 2022. Some of the general takeaways from the, those results showed that, as we know, elderberry production is increasing and that pre-commercial and commercial growers are quite diverse in their motivations and also their experiences that they bring to elderberry production. And uh, because of that, they use a variety of information sources and resources uh, to work towards uh, those objectives. So I ask sort of the central question of how are growers creating systems that lead to the adoption and maintenance of elderberry production? And I will explore a couple of the methods that I'm using uh, to answer that question over the next uh, couple of slides. Uh, so first, um, I'm speaking with elderberry growers um, within Missouri uh, to explore the exper their experiences and how elderberry production fits in at the farm level as a livelihood strategy, but also how connections um, to their external networks or other organizations enable them uh, to work towards their goals. So again, um, speaking with pre-commercial and commercial elderberry growers. Um, and specifically uh, talking to them about their motivations and objectives, their values, um, the assets and resources that they use to support production, and um, also their uh, the access to um, those assets and resources as well, um, along with barriers to entry and uh, transaction cost um, that um, that were required for them to. Um, to them for them to adopt um, elderberry as as an enterprise. Um, so um, this helps further understand the social and cultural context and, and perspectives of growers and how they're interacting with markets. Um, and for the growers that are selling commercially, um, also understand how they're generating profit. Uh, another method I'm using is a social network analysis, which is essentially looking at um, the relationships and resources uh, growers use to compose um, their networks in order to achieve um, their objectives. So who are they, who are they selling to, who are they interacting with um, to support uh, their objectives? Um, and how the nature of the support networks differs among growers with different uh, goals and objectives. And understanding these social networks that they use uh, can help highlight um, important strategies to increase the resilience of these farming systems, but also help facilitate action and the diffusion of knowledge and resources throughout networks that can hopefully uh, lead to a better 
understanding um, for opportunities to increase the adoption of other agroforestry um, practices as well. So this work hopes to use these methods to identify systems and networks that are important to the resilience of farming and, um, and offer insights into opportunities for the diffusion of new knowledge um, for systems like agroforestry and perennial agriculture um, that are inherently more complex uh, than com more conventional systems. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Ron Regord, the tree nut breeder and geneticist at the Center for Agroforestry. UMC has carried out black walnut improvement since uh, 2001, and today I'll provide key updates from our breeding program from 2022, as well as discuss progress made in our genetic mapping studies. Starting in 1998, UMCA assembled a collection of 64 cultivars, which with high percent kernel, compared to wild types and high nut quality. Most were named on-farm selections circulated amongst grower association networks. Until 2017, the program was carried out by Dr. Mark Cogshaw, shown in the upper right. Between 2002 and 2010, 1,250 interspecific hybrids were generated representing 30 crosses. 156 individuals were selected for multi-year evaluation from 2007 to 2010, with five traits included in Dr. Cogshaw's non-weighted rank-based index. Nine selections were retained for replicated trials prior to release. And this year, the program had several key milestones. These nine selections were established in on-farm trials as candidate releases as a part of our preliminary release program. The most promising of these selections was approved by tech transfer for patent and commercial release and quantitative trait loci for phenological traits were discovered and published for the first time in the species. We'll start with a quick status on our preliminary release program. As a quick refresher on these selections, here's an adapted version of the criteria considered by Dr. Cogshall in his rate-based index. Criteria are enclosed by the yellow box and include kernel percentage, the percentage of non-defective kernels, nut weight, tree diameter 10 centimeters above the root collar, and spur bearing represented by the cumulative number of nuts produced until year eight. Most selections are characterized by high kernel percentage, ranging from 28 to 37%, and low defect rates. Spur bearing is exceptional across these selections, particularly C7 and E6. This is the program pedigree for the selections with gray boxes showing parentage and green boxes showing breeding selections. Sparks 127, Sparrow, Daniel, and Emma K are prominent parents. Four replicated trials were established this fall on grower farms using grafted trees, each in a replicated complete block design. The growers represent distinct geographies in Missouri and commercial cultivar checks were included in the trials, including Emma K, Neil, and Daniel. Around 300 grafted trees remain in our nursery for 2023 establishment and additional grower trials. 11 additional growers have filled out our interest survey to establish a trial uh, later this year. The network will provide great genotype by environment data, uh, but also create an excellent network for demonstration and outreach to promote orchard adoption of black walnut. With the rest of our time, I'll report on results of this year's quantitative trait loci analysis, which was accepted to tree genetics and genomes at the end of this year. Uh, you could see the reference included on this transition slide. The objectives were to develop genetic resources for Eastern black walnut breeding, including ESTSSR markers, genetic map, uh, quantitative trait loci, and trait associated DNA markers. Um, we also sought to study phenological trait genetic architecture uh, and compare trait genetic architecture to that in Persian walnut, revealing trait genetic architecture and collinearity or syntony thereof between Eastern black walnut and Persian walnut provides important insight to bring strategy, trait evolution, and the transferability of knowledge more generally between the species. Here we will discuss some tangible applications to breeding 
In the UMCA repository, there are 46 protogenous and 14 protandrous cultivars. Protogeny is when female bloom precedes pollen shed. Protandry is the reciprocal. The range of genetic diversity for uh, bud break and bloom dates is shown in the image to the left, while phenological diversity for those individuals used in our crossing schemes to date is shown to the right. Uh, to explain the images, uh, you're seeing the dates up on uh, the top, and you're seeing horizontal bars that represent cultivars. And the, the dates here near my laser pointer uh, are bud break dates. The green bars are uh, female bloom dates, and the yellow bars are um, pollen shed dates from the staminate flowers. While intramorph mating is certainly possible, where protogenous individual can serve as the pollinizer for a protogenous cultivar, the protandrous morph, where pollen shed happens before female bloom, introduces valuable genetic diversity with utility in breeding. For example, early pistillate bloom protogenous cultivars like Emma K, brown nugget or football, which we see Emma K, brown nugget, and over here, football, have insufficient pollinizers. Pollen shed should, should start several days in advance of the uh, of female receptivity when that green bar starts, but we do not have genetic diversity for this. A few uh, within the current cultivars. A few protandrous cultivars like Krauss could be considered non-optimal pollinizers for the aforementioned cultivars. However, pollen shed is later than optimal in Krauss. Uh, and you can see Krauss here where it nearly lines up to Emma K, but it is not starting several days in advance of Emma K. Same for Brown Nugget, uh, and it's clearly inefficient for football. Protandrous individuals with high nut quality and productivity have a role in improving orchard level performance, even for later blooming protandrous cultivars, uh, like most of our uh, breeding parents or selections. In where protogenous and protandrous nut producing cultivars could have complementary bloom times. So they can both be um, commercially relevant cultivars and reciprocal pollinizers for each other. So moving on, bud break peak pistillate and peak staminate bloom were recorded in 2020 and 2021 by visiting the field every two to three days over April and May. The number of individuals displaying each trait is listed in the table here uh, by year and then combined unique genotypes over 2020 and 2021. Bud break is defined when over 50% of terminal buds are enlarged with split scales and green leaves are inside. You can see the stage circled here. Peak pistillate bloom is an estimation of when 50% of the pistillate flowers have become receptive and the same definition is applied to staminate flowers when they've reached pollen shed. Heterodichogamy is calculated by subtracting peak staminate, staminate bloom date from peak sta uh, pistillate bloom date to numerically represent the degree of flowering overlap. The multi-year data was used to calculate best linear unbiased predictions uh, this data was used in QTL analysis to represent the phenotype. The genetic map was constructed using 256 individuals from the population and 356 SNPs, also 62 ESTSSR markers, which were derived from conserved sequences found to be polymorphic in both Eastern black walnut and Persian walnut, which is essential for comparative analysis going forward. Comparison of marker placement between the Eastern Black Walnut map, let me see the Eastern Black Walnut map on our left, and the chromosome scale reference genome of the Persian Walnut Chandler, which is seen here on the right, provide very solid evidence for collinearity between the species. In the image, images, uh, the dark teal marks indicate uh, those markers that are mapped uh, and occur in the same order in both species. The red marks show few uh, show the few rearrangements. 
And we see those on uh, linkage groups or chromosomes 3, 7, and 13, another one on 16. However, it's clear to see the orientation is largely collinear from the perspective of these ESTSSR markers. A well, variation was observed for each trait. Uh, higher levels were observed for both bloom dates as seen by a standard deviation, uh, by the standard deviation and trait range. Interestingly, heterodichogamy segregated in a three to one pattern suggestive of a major effect loci. Uh, interesting variation was also observed in flowering times within respective morphs. Uh, the pistillate flowers of protogeny, protogenous progeny bloomed an average of four days earlier than those in protandrous progeny. Similarly, staminate flowers of protogenous progeny bloomed an average of eight days later than those in protandrous progeny. The mean interval between female and male bloom it, uh, was significantly longer in protogenous than protandrous individuals at eight days versus three and a half days. And you could see that in the difference between uh, this chart with protogenous individuals and this chart with protandrous individuals. There's considerably more variation in staminate bloom time in protogenous individuals when standardized to the female bloom date. It's also more uh, important to note that the average dates of bud break and bloom date in the UMCA repository do not suggest a close relationship between the timing of bud break morph type and the interval between the flowering of the two morphs. So this should be genetic variation that could be manipulated in breeding. Overall, five QTL were discovered for the various phenological traits investigated. Two were discovered for bud break and we see those uh, listed here on linkage group 2 and 11 uh, when we use the covariate of peak female bloom. Two were discovered for bud break, and, and we also show evidence for separate QTL influencing peak pistillate and staminate bloom that are linked to the QTL region for heterodichogamy. And this uh, separate distinction is based on non-overlapping 95 confidence intervals which are circled in these uh, gold boxes. So we see the confidence interval range for heterodichogamy is distinct for the most part from the 50% uh, uh, male and female blooms. So the bloom QTLs appear to be linked in, on the same chromosome, but distinct from each other. Our results add to the evidence for a major gene system controlling heterodichogamy with protogeny dominant to protandry in the Juglinaceae family. The minor QTLs for bud break on linkage groups two and 11 correspond to minor QTLs detected in Persian walnut. However, despite utilizing contrasting cultivars for bud break, with Schessler is very early and Sparrow is very late, the major QTL discovered in Persian walnut on chromosome one was not detected here. Uh, one hypothesis for that outcome is that Sparrow is homozygous at that locus, which would also explain the lower levels of variation observed um, in bud break phenotypically compared to bloom times. Markers closely associated with RQTL for heterodichogamy occur in a similar region to that discovered in Persian walnut, providing evidence for syntony for the trait and support for further study um, into the molecular basis and evolution of the trait within the walnut family. Uh, with the chromosome scale reference genome of Sparrow in progress and upcoming opportunities for fine mapping, comparisons between the species will become more precise. Looking forward, uh, we seek to add around 3,000 SNP markers to the analysis to give us higher power and resolution via new multi-species array collaborative. Uh, using these data will confirm results, narrow uh, QTL regions, uh, and also do this for uh, spur bearing traits and nut quality traits, with, which Ben Jablonski is reporting on in this annual review. We'll select new markers uh, from this array that are associated with bloom times for heterodichogamy uh, and heterodichogamy uh, for cast marker development and establish a pseudo F2 uh, population for marker testing. We also transitioned eight breeding selections with uh, excellent spur bearing and nut quality 
um, to replicated trials uh, from this mapping population. And lastly, I would like to uh, acknowledge our um, supporters of the Center for Agroforestry, the Dale Bumper Small Farm Research Center, and the USDA ARS, along with the Missouri Department of Agriculture. Beginning in 2020, the Reward Lab formed the Chestnut Improvement Network with the goal of standardizing on-farm chestnut breeding. Between 2020 and 2022, the Reward Lab evaluated elite grower selections across the eastern U.S. 600 trees were evaluated in the field for agronomic traits such as yield, beggar, disease, and pest resistance. Nut subsamples were collected and evaluated for weight, peelability, pellicle thickness, and quality defects. Here is a snapshot from some of the larger orchards that were evaluated. A general trend of increased disease slash nut defect rates were observed in the east and in the more southern orchards uh, there was a trend towards larger nuts. Selections with an average nut weight below 11 grams or had a defect rate greater than 5% or had average or below average crop loads uh, were considered as culls. After culling, around 50 elite trees remained. Growers were asked to send scion to Hark, where these were grafted and planted into a completely randomized orchard, augmented with commercial checks for long-term evaluations and ex situ conservation. Hello everyone, my name is Ben Jablonski. I'm a master's student in Dr. Ron Revord's lab. Today I'm reporting on the quantitative trait loci we've recently discovered for spur bearing habit, yield, and nut quality traits in eastern black walnut. The black walnut breeding program at the University of Missouri Center for Agroforestry seeks to improve the species Juglans nigra for orchard production. Our objectives for this project are to observe the segregation of spur bearing, yield, and key nut quality traits in the Sparrow by Schessler mapping population. Next is detecting quantitative trait loci for multiple traits. That will help inform breeding goals towards a high degree of spur bearing, high percent edible kernel, and nut size and dimension characteristics. These QTLs provide insight on the trait's genetic architecture. We want to elucidate whether the traits are governed by one or more loci and on which linkage groups the loci are present. We will also be considering whether DNA markers adjacent to the QTLs are suitable for marker-assisted selection. Data was imported into the program MapQTL6 for analysis. Analysis was performed with the interval mapping function using the default parameters. A 1000 iteration permutation test was then used to determine the significant logarithmic odds ratio or the LOD threshold of potential QTLs. QTLs were detected at the 0.01 significance threshold, which is shown by the dashed line on the figure to the right. The linkage map used for QTL analysis includes 356 SNPs and 62 EST SSRs. This map has relatively low marker density, but this research shows that it is enough to detect QTLs. An added benefit of the EST SSR markers is that they allow comparison between species. And one interesting finding was that the QTL for spur bearing on linkage group 11 was found to be collinear with the locus for lateral bearing discovered in the Persian walnut. This study was the first exploration into the genetic architecture of key traits in black walnut, discovering QTLs for traits important to the University of Missouri's breeding program. We discovered that traits related to nut size, kernel mass, and in-shell nut mass were all highly correlated. In-shell mass and percent kernel were found to be negatively correlated. Even with these trends, there was enough variation in the population to identify individuals with large kernels, high percent kernel, and a high degree of spur bearing 
and after this analysis we've identified candidate selections for future replicated trials. QTL analysis revealed three QTLs responsible for spur bearing habit and 11 QTLs related to nut quality traits. With these initial findings, we now know that increasing marker density will be required to identify flanking sets of markers needed for marker-assisted selection. There is still more work needed to move towards marker-assisted selection. Increasing the marker density and genotyping more individuals in the population will help improve our mapping power. We also expect that collecting multiple years of phenotypic data and increasing the marker density of our map will help validate results and narrow down QTL locations. The last objective will be selecting markers flanking the QTL peaks, with smaller gaps between them, which will be more suitable for marker-assisted selection. And that's it for the flash talk on my research, thank you for watching. Hello, I am Ben Schusler, and I will be presenting my work on the post-harvest practices and the improvement of black walnut germination. My project was focused on two studies, one to explore the effects of drying on moisture content and germination rates, and another on the seed float test to test the validity of the commonly used float test in sorting out inviable seeds. Key findings of my drying study were black walnut seeds need a minimum moisture content of it around 20% for germination, and the indicator dye tetrazoleum chloride overestimates seed viability in germination, but seems to mirror the results of germination. Key findings for my float study were that seeds that initially sank had the best germination rate overall, seemingly to prove the validity of the seed float test. Also, air drying seeds for a day would seem to increase the viability of seeds that would go on to float initially and then sink after 24 hours, but this drying seems to also decrease the viability in seeds that would would go on to readily sink. This figure shows the relationship between moisture content in blue, tetrazoleum chloride viability percentage in orange, and germination percentage in green. In relation to, to drying time from zero to four days, germination Greatly, was greatly reduced after 24 hours of heated drying as moisture content dips below 20%. This figure shows the comparison of germination rate in green and tetrazoleum chloride viability percentage in orange. For seeds that were air dried for a day uh, versus those that were not air dried. Um, it also shows uh, the comparison for seeds that persistently floated, those that readily sink, and the seeds that initially floated but then sink after 24 hours. As you can see here, uh, seeds that readily sank had the highest likelihood of germination overall. Seeds that persistently floated tended not to germinate if they germinated at all, and seeds that floated, then sank after 24 hours, had a high variability in germination. Thank you for your time. Hello, everyone. My name is Amanda Dwi Karina. Today's talk, I'm going to share about the Black Walnut uh, Report Project of 2022, connected by me, Amanda, and my advisor, Dr. Chang Holin. So walnut rich diet has been suggested to have beneficial effect related to hyperlipidemia, type 2 diabetes, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. However, the exact pathochemicals responsible for this beneficial effects remain relatively unclear. And it should also be noted that most studies in the literature are based on work with English walnut. So in this study, we are specifically use black walnut because some literature has suggested that 
the black wallet kernel has a diverse pathological profile and we are uh, interested to find find out the effect of black walnut in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So we conducted a pilot study to explore the feasibility of effectively delivering black walnut extract to rats. Uh, the objective of this project is to find, uh, evaluate the impact of black walnut supplementation on the overall welfare of the rats, and also to determine the effect uh, the effective dose and administration time frame of walnut extract in the rats to see an effect. So after four weeks of treatment with black walnut extract, we extract these serum samples and extract them to um, analyze using metabolomic approach. We compared 20 potential biomarkers compound in rat serum samples treated with black walnut extract and based on our study, we see a significant difference in some of the biomarkers compound in serum samples rat that get treated with black walnut extract. As shown in the figure with, in the treatment, the concentration of this, some of the biomarkers compound either decrease or increase to the normal concentration, or we can see as noted as the control mean. We also see this effect both in female and male mice. Further research is under progress to evaluate the chemical profile of serum samples between control and treatment using untargeted metabolomics approach. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Sonia and I'm a member of Professor Lynn's team. Uh, I work on strategies to reduce cadmium of fecal availability and plant uptake in avocado plants that has variety. Uh, avocado is an energetic fruit with high nutritional value. Uh, it's rich in protein and contains fat soluble vitamins, like in other fruits, uh, such as vitamins A and B, and moderate levels of vitamins D and E. Uh, it also contains different levels of um, yeah, fatty acid, uh, which is comparable to olive oil. And for that purpose, it is used for obtaining commercial oils from the fruit. Uh, interestingly, avocado has four times more nutritional value than any other fruit except banana. Uh, not only that the fruit is nutritious, but also in addition to the uh, important major compounds, contains substantial amounts of bioactive materials such as phytoestrols in the lipid fraction. Uh, yet fruits could have higher amounts of heavy metals such as cadmium, uh, limiting their market trade and consumption. Uh, in this context, we are devising ways to mitigate the heavy metal uptake by the plants to improve the market and the access of the consumer to a safe food product. Uh, our short-term approaches are soil amendments such as rice biochar, lime, uh, as well as foliar uh, iron application. Uh, the seedlings uh, are received from the greenhouse, uh, from the nursery, were uh, transplanted into tree pots uh, using uh, soil that we collected from the riverbank to mimic the California avocado farm soils. Uh, uh, and the soil was tested uh, for its characteristics and mineral levels, as well as contamination at MU soil and plant testing laboratory. Uh, secondly, uh, we are working on uh, protein material from the debris of the black walnut uh, and improving the uh, protein by enzymatic hydrolysis and testing uh, these fractions for their uh, anti obesity uh, effects uh, in terms of diabetes and uh, overweight. And uh, we're expecting to assist farmers in selecting the best variety as well as developing new products. Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. For my 
Center for Agroforestry Flash Talk, I will be talking about the new Pecan, Kernza, and Alfalfa alley cropping system, which is in partnership with the Danforth Center in their new Roots for Restoration project. So some background, this system is an alley cropping system, which is an agroforestry practice that utilizes uh, alleys of uh, herbaceous crops being planted between tree crops, in this case, Kernza, which is a perennial wheat, and alfalfa are being planted in between pecan trees. The assessments that this uh, study will make will focus on competition in these ag agro ecosystems. The overarching goal is to understand how plant root root interactions function and how they relate to plant communities and soil ecospheres. So this will have two components. The first is an above ground vegetative component. It will basically, the treatment will be applying different mowing radius, radiuses around the trees themselves with a zero foot, three foot, five foot, and seven foot radius. And that'll allow us to understand how aggressive the herbaceous component of the system is in competing against the trees, especially when they're in a kind of more of a sapling phase of growth and development. So it'll help us understand better how tree establishment works in alley cropping systems. And additionally, there will be a below ground component of this looking at water and nitrogen competition. Essentially, this will better determine which components of the system are monopolizing resources. Is it the current alfalfa or is it the uh, pecan? And this will better understand some of the dynamics within these uh, perennial agro ecosystems and better understand um, when nutrients and water are utilized and needed in the system. Additionally, beyond the, the scope of my master's uh, project, there will be additional uh, assessments of kind of soil microbiomes and those aspects of this alley cropping system. Thank you for listening.